right, so 6.1 part one, this is the first section we're going to look at um, that studies trig. So we've already broken down the word trig, and we saw that if you really literally look at it, like what it means, it means measuring three-sided shapes, or measuring triangles. So if we're going to be doing measuring of triangles, the first thing I want to do is break <coughs> down what a triangle is. And a triangle is made up of three angles. Now, when we think of an angle, there's really two ways you can think of it. You can think of an angle that's drawn all by itself, that's not part of a shape, or you can think of it as being within a shape. This definition that I'm giving you right here is the definition of an angle that's drawn all by itself. So you take <coughs> One ray, take another ray, and if you put the two rays together so that they have a common starting point, like that, now you've created an angle. The point where the two rays start from, that is called the vertex. Now, if we draw a triangle, not just two rays, but if we just draw a triangle, these are angles as well. But I wouldn't say that this is where two rays meet. What do you call each one of the sides in a triangle? It's not a ray, because it doesn't go on forever. Anybody know what we call it? Yeah. It's a segment. So when you draw a polygon, if you have two line segments that come together, we also call that an angle. If you have two rays that come together, that's an angle that's not part of the polygon. Just an angle all by itself. When we draw an angle, angles have two sides to them. We call one the initial, and we call the other one the terminal. And we have to be able to figure out which side is the initial, which side is the terminal. So like if I ask you in class, like, okay, draw something from the initial to the terminal, what, what does that mean? Well, if you look at your angle, if you go inside the angle, Okay, go inside it, and you rotate counterclockwise. Wherever you start, that's the initial. Wherever you end, that's the terminal. So if I drew one like this, I go between my two rays, and I rotate counterclockwise. Wherever I start, that's the initial, and wherever I end, that's the terminal. We generally like to draw it with the initial side horizontal. We don't like to draw the initial side pointing up into the air like that. that that's kind of a weird way to do it. Uh, so we're going to stick with drawing it like I did on the right most of the time. Okay, but I'm going to write down what we just did. So you go in a counterclockwise direction from the initial, ending at the terminal. I think I have another picture too. CCW, uh, in case I didn't explain that, that's counterclockwise. So, maybe I should put that. We talk a lot about rotation in trick. So, the two directions you can rotate in, usually we call it clockwise or counterclockwise. That's clockwise. Counterclockwise is like that. OK, 
Okay, and before I put that up, was there a question? Yeah? Um, yeah, when you say start, what do you mean by start? Right so, you have two rays, and you're going to rotate between them counterclockwise. This side would be considered the side that you start at. This side would be the one that you end at as you rotate counterclockwise between them. And does that ever switch? Like, do those two things ever switch? No. Okay. Nope. It doesn't matter how you twist or, or turn your angle. I mean, you can have it, you know, one side pointing like that, the other side pointing like that. As you rotate counterclockwise, wherever you start is the initial, and wherever you end is the turn. Always. Doesn't matter how you how you do it. And as I said, it's generally preferred to have the initial side horizontal pointing to the right. Then that eliminates confusion completely about which side is initial and turn. Now, I mentioned here that you really have two angles, because when you dry rays, you can think about the angle that's inside. You also have an angle that's outside. Almost every time, we are talking about the angle that's inside. We call this the, the interior part of the angle. And then there's also an exterior part that's on the outside. We're not talking about the exterior part. Any question on that? Okay, so when we try to solve for a letter or solve for an angle, a lot of times we need a way to represent it temporarily because we're not going to know what it is. In algebra, something that's pretty common to use is like x or y. In trig, a lot of times we use Greek letters to represent an angle that we don't know. So like if I was drawing this triangle, I might use a Greek letter like that to represent that angle because I don't know it. Um, does anybody know what Greek letter that is? Fish. Looks kind of like fish. Anybody know, yeah, which one that is? Yeah, alpha. that's alpha. So alpha is a Greek letter that comes up a lot. Uh, we might also use another Greek letter, like that. Anybody know what Greek letter that is? Yeah? Beta. That's beta. These are all lowercase. There are capital versions of them. And we don't usually use the capital. We use lowercase. Uh, and this one looks kind of like a Y, a little bit. Um, does anybody know what that one is? Yeah? Uh, the, the circle with the line going through the middle of it, that one's going to be theta. Uh, this one is gamma. That's gamma. These three are used a lot when we do triangles. So when we talk about triangles, alpha, beta, and gamma are the three letters we use a lot. Um, the next one I already told you that is theta. And how about the last one? It looks kind of like a W, but it curves in on the sides and it loops on itself in the middle. Yeah. It's omega. That's a lowercase omega. You might think, well, wait, I thought omega looked like that. Well, it, that's capital. Okay, that's a lowercase. We tend to use this when we talk about graphing trig functions. I mean, any one of them could technically be used anywhere, just like algebra. But those are the most common Greek letters that we will use. Not, not all today, but throughout the next three chapters. I think I'm going to use this one quite a bit today. Okay, so I told you that when we draw an angle, we normally like to do it a certain way. Okay, we like to have the initial side <coughs> pointing in a certain <coughs> direction. And that's called standard position. So if I asked everybody to draw a 90 degree angle, 
Some people might draw it like this. Some people may draw it like this. Those are both 90 degree angles. But if I asked everybody to draw a 90 degree angle in standard position, then everybody's angle should look the same. Two things have to happen for an angle to be in standard position. So usually you draw an angle on like a xy axis. So you use graph. You put the vertex of your angle at the origin. And you make sure that the initial side is pointing to the right. So it's on the, what we call the positive x-axis. So that's called standard position. So that angle that's in red, that's an example of an angle that's drawn in standard position. Vertex at the origin. Initial side pointing to the right. How about now? Is that red angle in standard position? No, it No, what, what's wrong with it? Yeah, the vertex isn't at the origin. Okay, the initial side is on the positive x axis, so that, that's good. But we didn't put the. Um, we didn't put the vertex at the origin. Okay, now what if I did something like this? Oops. I'll move this back over here. Like that. All right, how about that? Is that standard position? No. No? What's wrong with it now? Um, the initial side is not on the um, positive x axis. Yeah, the initial side is not on the positive x axis. The terminal side is on the positive y-axis, but that doesn't say anything about doing that. So the initial side needs to be pointing to the right, just like that. Any questions on what it means to draw an angle in standard position? Okay. So there's a couple different ways that we can measure angles. Um, degrees is one of the types of things we can use. Does anybody know the other one that uses, uses the log trait? So we're going we're gonna to talk about the other one. Uh, and the big thing is going to be how do we convert between the two. Right? But degrees is what we're going to start with. If I had a circle, okay, so think of it like this. I have a circle, and I started here, and I did one complete rotation. Now you can rotate counterclockwise, or you can rotate clockwise. But, and I'll explain what the difference is between the two. But if you rotated one full rotation, how many degrees are in a full rotation? Anybody know? Yeah? Yeah, it's 360. And I'm specifically going to go in a counterclockwise direction. And if I stop right back where I started, I get 360. What do you think would happen if I went the other direction? Anybody have a guess what kind of what kind of angle I would get? Yeah? Would be a negative angle? Yeah, it would be a negative. So the difference between a positive and a negative angle when you rotate on a circle, just controls whether the number is positive or negative. Clockwise angles, the way I'm moving right now, are measured with a negative. Counterclockwise angles are measured with a positive. So we're gonna we're gonna write that down. So one complete counterclockwise revolution is 360. So if a complete revolution is 360, um, how much would half a counterclockwise revolution? So it's still going to be positive. We're just, we're just talking about positives, yeah? 180 degrees. So, so 180 is half revolution. And how about a quarter? Yeah? 90. 90. And you might have noticed I didn't really stop on them quick. 
But if you look at this bottom number, it has something with a pi in it. That bottom number has something to do with the other way you can measure an angle. And if I stop at like 0, 90, 180, some of those angles we just talked about, like half and a quarter, they have this number with pi. And we'll, we'll talk about what that is. Now that I've shown you that, does anybody know the other unit that you can use to measure angles? The pi is measuring something. But it's in a unit we haven't talked about yet. Radians. Radians. Yep. So we'll we'll talk about radians in a little bit. Uh, okay, I already mentioned that to you. But angles that are going in a counterclockwise direction are positive. The only way you would know if an angle is going clockwise or counterclockwise is if there was an arrow drawn like this. Now you know that this is a 90 degree counterclockwise angle because I drew an arrow. So counterclockwise angles are measured with positive numbers. Clockwise angles are measured with negative numbers. When we talk about drawing a triangle, uh, negative doesn't really make sense. We don't use negatives. The only time that we generally use a negative angle is if we're talking about rotation on a circle and we want the rotation to be clockwise. Now, when I got to 360, I stopped. But I didn't have to stop. Angles can be as big as you want. You can go into the thousands. All that it means is if your angle is bigger than 360, you have more than one rotation. Or more than one revolution. So I want to go back to that program where I can draw different angles. I'm going to draw two angles, and I'm going to ask you a question about each one of them. Okay, so let's look at that angle, 90 degrees. In this picture, I can't move the initial side. All I can do is move the terminal side. So I want you to Look at that picture and just kind of memorize where the initial and where the terminal sides are. Now I want to go like this. All I want to know in that picture is how do the initial and terminal sides in that angle compare to where they just were. They know. Yep. Yeah. The They're the same. The initial and terminal sides in that picture are exactly the same <coughs> as what they were before. And that's at 450. About now. They're the same again. And that's at 810. And if I went like this. That's at 1170, and they're the same again. If that spiral wasn't there, and this number wasn't there, you wouldn't know that there's any difference between the four things that I just drew. 90, 450, I think it was 810, and 1170. They all have the same initial and terminal sides. And if you have angles that have the same initial and terminal sides, those are called co-terminal. Co-terminal. And Lauren, did you have a um, um, question? Is that graph, like, uh, or the rotations that you just made, would that angle still be in standard position even though it's a relative? Yep. 
Yeah, it's still in standard position because the vertex never moved from the origin, and the initial side always stayed on the positive x-axis. So it doesn't matter the number of rotations, it just matters the positioning on that axis itself. Yep, yep. So let's think about all those angles that I just found that had the same initial and terminal sides. So I had, if I go back to the beginning, I had 90, 450, 810, and 1170. So let's think about those numbers. 90, 450, 810, and 1170. A lot of times when we're looking at an angle, we don't necessarily care how many times it went around. We care where that red circle is. Where did it stop? Well, all those angles have the red circle stopping at exactly the same spot. So when we do trig with these angles, these angles are all the exact same thing for purposes of doing trig because they all stop at exactly the same stop, same spot. They stop at the top. And sometimes that's all we care about. Does anybody see what the pattern is? Like how you would get from one to the next here? Yeah? yeah you add 360. So you can add 360 degrees to get from one to the next. So if you're ever asked to find angles that are coterminal, all you have to do is add 360 degrees. Now, what about this? What's the pattern there? Yeah? Subtract 360. And when we're doing trig, if I give you a problem about 1,170 degrees, that's a big angle. That's hard to think about in your head. So what we often do is we try to make this angle easier to work with. You can make it easier to work with by subtracting 360. Generally, we prefer to work with angles that are between 0 and 360. If you have an angle that's too big, subtract 360 to make it smaller. If you have an angle that's too small, you can add 360 to make it bigger. So let's say you gave me an angle like negative 2,000 degrees. Off the top of my head, I, I can't picture that. I know it's gone around a bunch of extra times, but I, I can't picture out well, where, where would it stop. So what I can do is I can add 360 to that angle. And I can keep doing that until I get finally something I can visualize in my head. So I'm going to keep going. 160. I can visualize 160 degrees in my head. Because if I draw my axes, this is 0, that's 90, and that's 180. So I know 160 is just a little bit before 180. So if I had to draw an angle that was 160, I put my initial side there, and I put my terminal side about like that. I'm just estimating. But it's a lot easier for me to think about 160 than it is negative 2,000. All right, so let's try um, sketching a few different angles. And then once we sketch it, we're going to give an angle that's coterminally a positive and a negative. So let's start with 30 degrees. 
So I've drawn our axes. When you draw your axes, zero is always to the right. 90 is at the top. And not that we need it in this one, but 180 would be on the left. And 270 is at the bottom. So, where would 30 degrees be? I want to draw my terminal side so it points at roughly 30 degrees. Well, Alba, could you tell me roughly where that would be? Degrees? Yeah. <clears throat> About a little under halfway 90. Yeah, it's, it's less than half. Half would be 45. 30 is one third of the way through the quadrant. So try to draw your angle so that it's rotated about one third of the way. Okay, roughly. So there's your initial side, because we're going to be drawing it in standard position. And again, just an estimate. I'll just make it less than half. All right, here's x and y. That looks, looks okay. Okay, so there's our, there's our angle. And now it says to find one that's coterminal, that's positive, and negative. Okay, what would, well, actually, just tell me first, what do you add to 30 to get an angle that's coterminal? Yeah? 360. So if you add 360 to that, what do you get? 390. 390, good. So that's coterminal and positive, and let's do one that's negative. What would be an angle that is coterminal with 30, but I'd like it to be negative? Yep. Would it be negative 330? Yep, negative 330. That's not the only answer. He could have added 360 seven or eight times, but we're just trying to keep it as simple as possible. Questions on the first one? Let's try 145. So we know the initial side is going to be here. That's the same on every problem. Uh, where's 145? Anybody tell me roughly where, where that one would be? Yep. About halfway between 90 and 180. Okay, would it be exactly halfway, or would it be a little bit closer to 90, or a little closer to 180? It would be exactly halfway. Not, yeah, no, a little closer to 180. It's a little closer to 180. Exactly halfway would be a 130. So at 145, it's just a little bit more than half. So. I mean, I don't know. That, I guess that looks fine. So that's 145. Okay. So now, let's find one that's coterminal and positive. So, Aiden, how do I get an angle that is coterminal uh, with 145? Um, you have to add 360. Yep. And if you add 360 to 145, uh, what do you get? Uh, you get 145 plus 365. Yep, so 145 plus 360. 505. Yep, 505. And we'll do one that's negative. So we're going to take 145, and this time minus 360. 45 minus 360, and we get negative 250. Any questions on it? Oh, let's try one more. Uh, negative 45. So I drew my initial. Uh, what is negative 45 going to be? Is that many? You go 
45 degrees clockwise? Yeah, we're going to go 45 degrees clockwise. And how much of a quadrant is 45 degrees? It's like, oh, half. It's half. So full quadrant is 90. So this one is going to be exactly halfway in quadrant four. Just draw that the best you can. Okay, so coterminal. Positive and negative. So the positive, I'll give you that one. The positive would be 315 if we wrote if we add 360 to it. And what about the negative? It's negative 360 minus 45. Or negative 405. Good, negative 405. Okay, so just a little bit of practice working with coterminal angles. All right, so next thing, a few, I think, a few vocabulary things. Um, an acute angle. Yep? Sorry, when you first see, what was the angle? Uh, negative 405. <coughs> What does it mean if an angle is acute? Less than 90, but it has to be more than something else. Yeah? It's also more than zero. It does have to be more than zero. So like a negative 10 degree angle is not considered acute. Okay. Acute angle applies to positive angles less than 90. Uh, okay, how about, uh, let's do this one different. What if it's exactly 90? Anybody know what you call that? Yeah? Isn't that just called a right angle? Yep, that's a right angle. So exactly 90 is a right angle. Alright, how about an obtuse angle? This is another one where it has to be between two things. Yeah? Uh, more than 90, less than 3. Uh, I like the more than 90. So theta. This Greek letter represents an angle, so the angle has to be greater than 90, and it has to be less than, yep, yeah, it has to be less than 180. If it starts to get bigger than 180, I think the name is called a reflex angle. It's not used very much, so don't quote me on that. But obtuse is between 90 and 180. How about complementary angles? So the first three terms apply to an individual angle. Complementary, I'll give you a hint, it applies to a pair. It's when the pair do something. Yep. It's when the pair adds up to 90. It's when the pair adds up to 90, and the angles have to be positive. So we would not say that like negative 10 and 100 are complementary. And what's the other term that you study a lot with complementary? This, is, this adds up to something else. Yeah? Supplementary. Supplementary. Supplementary is when they add up to 180. So when we talk about negatives, they don't have complements or supplements. And negative angles do not have complements or supplements. Okay, so again, I'm assuming most of that you've done in geometry. Right, so let's take an angle, and let's just find the complement and the supplement. Okay, what would be the complement of an angle that's 48 degrees? 42, yep, because those would add up to 90. And what would be the complement, or what would be the supplement? Yep. Uh, 132. 132, good. How about negative 18? What would be the complement of negative 18? Yep. Doesn't have one. No, no comment. 
How about the supplement? Yeah? No, it doesn't happen. How about x degrees? All right, and I got to tell you a little bit about x, because if x was a negative angle, it wouldn't have a complement or supplement. Let's say x is bigger than 0, and it's smaller than 90. Because if it was bigger than 90, it wouldn't have a complement. So it's between 0 and 90. What would the complement be of x? Yeah? It would be 90 minus x. Yep, it would be 90 minus x. And what's your supplement? Yep. 180 minus x. 180 minus x. So the last example is basically the general formula that you do in your head to find complements and supplements. Subtract it from 90 to 180. Any questions on that? So, last thing. So, radians is another way that you can measure an angle. And if you look at the word radian, it looks a lot like the word radius. And the two are connected. So, the first thing that I usually do when I describe radians is I give you kind of a picture of what it, what it would look like. And what I'm going to do in this picture is I'm going to draw what's called a central angle. That's just an angle that's in a circle. That's all. That's a central angle. So let's say that we put an angle inside a circle. And that angle is angle ACB, or BCA. You could say it either way. C is the center of the circle. These two rays, CA and CB, come out from the center. And they hit the edge of the circle at two points. Here and there. If you connect point A to B, following the path of the circle, you get what's called an arc. That's called an intercepted arc because that's where the two rays intercept the edge of the circle. It's where they, where they hit the circle. And the notation for that is arc AB. The notation is not super important. Now, this one isn't drawn perfectly to scale, but just kind of imagine what I'm about to say. Let's say you took like a piece of string, and you put it at C, you put it at B, you took that, and then you put it on a ruler, you could measure how long it is. Now, let's say that you did the same thing on arc AB. Took a piece of string, laid it right down on that red arc, and then straightened it out on a ruler and measured it. If the length of this and the length of that came out exactly the same, then this angle right here would be one radian. If those two things came out the same, if they didn't, then it would not be one radian. It would either be more or less. But that angle would be exactly one radian if the length of that arc in red and the length of the radius were equal. That's, that picture is not too bad. I think the angle is a little bit bigger than it should be. It should probably be just a little smaller to make it look accurate. Now, that doesn't tell you how to convert between degrees and radians. All that that tells you is that if you had a circle and that arc measured the same as the radius, it gives you kind of a visual you could think of for what a radian would look like. But what we really want to do in the last part is come up with a formula to convert between degrees and radians.
And the way you come up with a formula to convert between two things, any two things, is you need a true statement about the two things. For example, let's do something with like minutes and seconds. Can somebody give me a true statement about minutes and seconds that relates the two? It can be anything you want. I prefer a simple one. You could make it complicated. Yeah? There are 60 seconds in one minute. Yeah, that's probably the simplest one. 60 seconds in one minute. Now that we have this true fact, if somebody said, well, what about 320 seconds? How many minutes is that? I could fill that in on the right. Put X minutes on the bottom. And I could solve it by cross multiplying. The key is this. We had a connection between seconds and minutes to start with. How did we know that? We have to know that prior. So you have to know something prior when you want to do conversion between two things. And if you don't know it, you have to figure this out somehow. So you look it up in a book. Whatever you're going to do. Now let's kind of apply that to revolutions and degrees. What's the connection between a revolution and degrees? Yeah? One full revolution is 360 degrees. Right. One revolution equals 360 degrees. So if I wanted to convert between degrees and revolutions, I could use this fact, and I could set up a proportion. The problem is I want to know the question mark right there. How many radians in a revolution? Because if I can figure out this, then I can do anything I want to convert between degrees and radians. But I need to start with something that's true. So that's what we're going to figure out. Like I said before, you can't just figure this out from scratch. You've got to start with something. Either you've got to look something up, or somebody has to give you a hint. Like you, you've got to know something about the two. And this is the hint that I'm going to give you. We're going to draw a circle. And it's going to be a circle with a very specific size. It's called a unit circle. And it has a radius of 1. That's what makes something a unit circle. Radius is 1. Now, why am I using a circle with a radius of 1? Well, I could say the same thing here. Why did somebody give me a number with 60 in it? Why didn't they use 120? Well, they could have. could have said 120 seconds is 2 minutes. But generally, doing a conversion with a 1 in it makes it easier to do. So that's why we're going to look at a circle with a 1 in it. It makes it easier to do. I could do a 2, I could do a 6, you could do whatever number you want. But 1 is the easiest. And there's something special that happens on a unit circle. And I'm going to show you what it is. Let's say that I, I drew that angle. I'm going to move that one so you don't think it's the angle. So it's one unit. If this is a unit circle, and I measure the size of that angle in radians, so let's say we had a protractor that measured in radians, and I measured it, and then I measured the length of this arc with a piece of string. The number that I get on my protractor when I measure it in radians, and the length of that piece of string when I take it and put it on my ruler, would come out exactly the same, always, on this side circle. So the size of this angle is always equal to the length of this arc on this side circle, all of the time. If I had a protractor and a piece of string, I could show you that they would be exactly the same. Let me write that down. So on a unit circle, the 
the size of the angle is equal to the length of the arc. Those are the most important five words in that whole thing I just wrote down. The size of the angle is equal to the length of the arc. Always. And the nice thing about this fact is it is a fact that is in radians. So it's going to tell us something in radians in a second. So remember the goal here. The goal is to figure out how many radians to go all the way around the circle. I know it's 360 degrees. I don't want to know that. I already know that. I want to know how many radians to go all the way around the circle. But the measure of this angle is equal to what, according to this sentence? The measure of the angle is the same as what? Circumference. The circumference, exactly. It says the measure of the angle is equal to the length of the arc. That's the arc around the edge of the circle. So if the size of the angle that goes all the way around is equal to the arc. Well, there's my arc. My arc would be the entire circle if the angle went all the way around. So if I can figure out the circumference of that circle, that will be exactly the same as the angle for that circle. They are exactly the same thing. All I need is the formula for the circumference. So what is the circumference of a circle? Remember, yeah. Is it is it pi? Uh, there's a pi in it. Is it radius squared times pi? Um, pi r squared is area, so that is something else. Um, just not the one we're going to use here. But there still is a pi in it. What else? Remember, yeah. Is it radius? Over pi? Uh, there is a radius in it, but it is not a divided by pi. I guess you could write it with diameter too, but I, we're gonna we'll do it with radius. Yeah. Uh, that's the area. Yeah. Yeah. Two pi r. Yes. That's the circumference. And again, you might be thinking, wait, why is the circumference important? Because the size of this arc is equal to the size of the angle. And that's what I want to know, the size of the angle. But since it's equal to the size of the arc, and I know how to figure out the arc, then I should know how to figure out the angle because it's the same number. What's the radius in a unit circle? Yeah, one. one. So what's two pi times one? And you can leave, leave your answer with pi. Yeah? Three pi. Just two pi. So in a unit circle, the circumference is two pi. But it says right here that the length of the circumference, the circumference is just an arc, the length of the circumference is equal to the measure of the angle in radians. So I know if the length of the circumference is 2 pi, that's equal to the angle, which is also 2 pi. So that's the answer. There are 2 pi radians in one revolution of a circle. 2 pi. So that, that's the answer. And now that we know how many radians in 360 degrees, we can come up with a little bit simpler conversion. If 2 pi equals 360, what do you think 
one pi would equal. Yeah? 180. Now, usually when we give someone a conversion, there's a 180. This has a pi and a 180. There's no 1 in there. One side is pi, one side is 180. Let's say I wanted to. Let's say I wanted to get a one on this right side. What could I divide both sides by, and it would give me a one on the right? Yeah. Like, does it have to be um, a gradient, or can it be a degree? Or uh, it's just going to be a number. One eighty. Yeah. You divide each side by one eighty. What should you get? Pi divided by 180 equals 1 degree. So now you have a formula for 1 degree. Pi divided by 180 equals 1 degree. Now, let's say I wanted a formula for 2 degrees. I could just take this and do something on each side. If I wanted a formula for 2 degrees, and I wanted to know what it would equal, what could I multiply each side by here? Just multiply each side by 2. I could just put a 2 in that box, and now you've got a calculation for 2 degrees. What if I wanted to know 5 degrees? What could I multiply each side by? So it would say 5 degrees equals, and then I have something I could type in. Yep. Multiply by 5. It's not what you're putting in the box. It's this. If you want to convert degrees to radians, you take whatever you want to convert and you do two things to it. You multiply it by pi, and then you divide it by 180. Those are the two steps to convert from degrees to radians. Multiply by pi, and then divide by 180. That's degrees to radians. Yes? So why did you multiply by pi? Just as an example to show the pattern on each side. Okay. Doesn't matter if it's a 5, a 12, a 13.2. You put whatever number you want in that box, and that's the calculation you do. Multiply it by pi, and divide it by 1. Now, when we convert radians to degrees, those two things just switch. It's just the opposite. So instead of multiply by pi, it's multiplied by 180. And instead of divide by 180, it's divide by pi. They, they switch. So we'll, we'll try maybe one example of each, and then we can practice some more when we do the homework tomorrow. But just remember, degrees to radians, pi over 180. Radians to degrees, 180 over pi. It's always one of those two fractions. You just have to remember which one is which. Let's try it again. Okay, convert 30 degrees to radians. It's either going to be pi over 180 or 180 over pi. Let's go look up. Convert degrees to radians. Do I use pi over 180 or do I use 180 over pi? To convert degrees <coughs> to radians. Yeah? Uh, 
That's the pie over 180. Pie is in the top. 180 goes in the bottom. And another reason the 180 goes in the bottom is because if you have degrees in the top and degrees in the bottom, one in the top, one in the bottom, they cancel each other out. You always want them to cancel out. How many times does 30 go into 30? Yeah. Once. And how many times does 30 go into 180? Yeah. Six times. Six times. So the final answer is 1 times pi divided by, the only number in the bottom is 6. And you do not put RAD. So then how do you know if it's a radian? Well, there's only one time you label an angle, and that's if it's degrees. You put the little circle. If you leave the circle off a number, then that makes it radians. So do not put RAD. And let's try one where we convert the other one. Convert to degrees. When we convert to degrees, it's 180 divided by pi. So 180 divided by pi. Pi's cancel. <clears throat> How many times does 2 go into 180? 90. And what's 3 times 90? 270. Just make sure because this problem said degrees, you need to put the degree symbol. If you leave the degree symbol off, you just wrote 270 radians. Now it's degrees. And that's all you do to convert between radians and degrees. So we can we can look more at those uh, tomorrow. We can practice some more. Okay, so that's um, the homework. So there's lots of little things like find the complement, find the supplement, draw an angle, and then towards the end it's converting between radians and degrees. But they're all very, very, very quick problems. We'll, uh, we'll take a look at that tomorrow.